Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. The fullness of the priesthood, what exactly does that mean? In our next conversation with Dr. Margaret Toscano, we'll talk about three types of priesthood that I wasn't really familiar with. Messianic, ecclesiastical, and charismatic. What do those mean, and how do they relate to the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood, which most Mormons are familiar with? You won't want to miss this episode. I really learned a lot. I think it's really fantastic. Now back to our conversation. But then one of the questions I've dealt with a lot since then is this issue of, like a lot of people, even with my first speech, said, well, we don't want the priesthood in the temple. We only want the church priesthood. Right. That, that, I'm glad yeah, you're exactly. That. And I said, well, and, and so I try to answer this by the time we get to Strangers in Paradox, six years later, right? But I would say a couple of things. First of all, I do think that that Joseph Smith set up these two different mechanisms for priesthood. And I wanted to say with the charismatic, the ecclesiastical, and the, and the I want to call it the messianic, the fullness really is to be made into the full stature of the measure of Christ. And that I think he saw those as interconnected. Would, would you include the sealing power with the messianic priesthood? Yes. Is that what you're saying? So, right. So are you saying that both men and women, if they have this messianic priesthood, would have the sealing power? Yes. Wow. That's what the statements of Joseph Smith imply. You know, I could dig it up. Okay. But no, the seal, yeah, absolutely. And I also believe... And so well, let, let me back up here. because yeah. So this is the 1836 vision of Elijah that... But then he and but you're saying that that was the development of this messianic priesthood. It begins and, there, and I think I mean there are statements where Joseph Smith says the church a couple of things um, that and t that you have Elijah appearing, but you don't have really the bestowal of this messianic priesthood until Nauvoo. So that I can't remember the date, whether it's 1838 or 1839, where Joseph Smith says the priesthood is not yet properly organized. It's kind of a startling statement because you go, what? We already have everything that we think now of as being. But he said that. Two things he said. The, that, the church was, that the priesthood had not been fully restored. He says that in 1838 or 1839 because I believe that he did not think until you had the 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 fullness the messianic priesthood that you really didn't have the full manifestation he he did see it as in stages uh but also i was going to say and then he says later that the church could not be properly organized until the temple was there and i see that not just as ceilings yeah i think he saw ceilings as important and that can connects back to how i think he envisioned zion but he he saw the he saw the he saw the the ceilings as part of that, but for me, the whole idea that you can't have a, a Zion society until you have people that are transformed. And if you think about the primary purpose of priesthood, is that that by receiving the Spirit of God, serving other people, doing these things, the ordinances and so forth, and working to build a just society that it transforms you, you literally become transformed into the image of God. And that, and that that transformation, I think for Joseph, was the ultimate purpose of the priesthood. So even like in the temple, the idea that you're going through these stages, right, of endowment of different levels of priesthood, really the endowment shows that, the, that sort of in a ritual way, it shows that theology. You go through the stages, and where do you end up at the end? You embrace God through the veil. And you embrace God, and in a way, you've become like God, right, through that process. Hmm. So, I think, so, and that goes to this other concept. I really feel like that he was trying to bring the charismatic priesthood, which is spiritual gifts, and the power of God that is a real, for him, it's a real thing, right? It's not some woo-woo-woo thing. It's like again, almost a substance, right, that you can touch. That was real, but he wanted that to be manifest through the, the physical world. So the idea was that through these stages of priesthood, you're trying to bring it all together so that the spiritual and the physical intertwine. The ecclesiastical and the 
temple priesthood intertwine. I think that's what he was going for, mm. <laughs> but it kind of got split. So let me make sure yeah. I'm, I'm following okay. that. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is a lot. I no, talk this fast. is great. <laughs> this is awesome. Because there's there's two other there's two yeah. two different directions I kind of want to go with that. Um, number one, you know, in well, and it's a little bit different. We we call the Aaronic priesthood the uh, pre preparatory priesthood, right? And so for boys, although it wasn't this way in the 1800s, no. you know, we progress from deacon to teacher to uh -huh. priest, and then. The Melchizedek priest right. elder in that. Are you saying with the temple that this, um, with the endowment, that this is this is a progression for women, and so they they just skip Aaronic priesthood altogether? Is that is that what you're saying? Theologically, and what I think Joseph Smith would have said is yes. Okay. But I also think. I think he was trying to bring these together. I think I may have said that before too. Mm -hmm. That you have the charismatic priesthood, which is this spiritual power of God, which I think he saw, and this is again what I was saying about the, he saw the necessity of bringing the spiritual and the physical together. So he wanted both, not just a charismatic priesthood, but also a priesthood with offices and ordinances and that was very embodied and that was in a community. And there we go back to the notion of Zion, right? That, but so I do believe that he thought that women, they could skip the whole thing and they could then function and use the priesthood in, um, in, uh, in any way. I mean, and again, the temple kind of says that with, if you have, if you've been, I won't use the language of the temple, I want to, to, to and, and things have changed since the last time I've been there. <laughs> but, a few but, times. No, quite a few <laughs> times. But I think that, that the idea was that when you have the robes of the priesthood on, which is a symbol of, of, being, of having the priesthood offices and power, because really I think he saw the, the milk, he saw the fullness, he loved that phrase, fullness. Fullness of the priesthood, fullness of the gospel, fullness of the everlasting covenant, fullness of times. Because he really saw himself, and you see this in the way he describes priesthood, he saw himself as being, um, and I see him as sort of a, as well as a prophet, as a, more, more than a prophet, because he's not really a prophet in the Old Testament sense. I see him more as a visionary and Mormons hate the word mystic, but I wrote about mystics for my dissertation. And really the mystic is somebody that connects with God and sees the heavens, right? Uh, that's how I see Joseph Smith. He was a visionary. And I think that his idea, he had this vision of things, and I think he was kind of putting the pieces together, but wasn't complete when he died. So I think he had this idea that, okay, now we're going to do the endowment. Men have kind of been coming up here. We're going to bring women here on this sideline, right? And they both are given the fullness of the priesthood. And that really it's the fullness is again like this umbrella that encompasses every other aspect of priesthood. He had so many different divisions that he saw priesthood. Now we just think of Aaronic and Melchizedek, but he would talk about the priesthood of um he used there, I was going to tell you that if you look at the words of Joseph Smith and all the sermons and the collection of documents, between like about mm, 1838 or 39 and 44, he gave a bunch of several really important discourses on priesthood, and he keeps giving new divisions. So he'll talk about the priesthood of Elias, Elijah, and Messiah. That's one of his talks. And then he'll talk about Moses. Elias, Elijah, and Messiah, or Abraham. And then there's that big discourse where you could see it, where he says, you know, Adam is first. So the priesthood starts with Adam. And then he has all the keys, and then they're brought down. And then everybody has to return them to Adam. And then Adam turns them back to Christ. Because really, and I mean, this is interesting. I, I love the fact about the Lord doesn't like nicknames. Oh, yeah? Well, in... Isn't it 107 where it says that the real name of the priesthood is the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. That's the messianic priesthood. But we call it Melchizedek to not use the name, keep saying that long name, right? So the Melchizedek, because Melchizedek was the great high priest who in a sense was like in the image of, of Christ. So 
in those speeches, he keeps like bringing in new terminology, right? But then there's another statement where he says, really, all the priesthood is one, but you can receive different portions of it. And, and those portions maybe have different functions, right? But the fullness of the priesthood that's in the endowment and the second anointing, that includes all of these different kinds of priesthoods that he talks about. So I think he saw, and again, this is not absolutely clear, but from how I read the documents, he saw women coming in here, but with a fullness, you could do anything else. And therefore, uh, and I come back to the Relief Society, therefore, they could function in the church priesthood. And that's been my argument. Because again, I have a lot of friends who go, oh, that temple priesthood, I don't want that. I want the real church priesthood. That's the real thing. And I'm saying, well, really, the fullness encompasses that. But here's the tricky thing. Even if you have the fullness of the priesthood, you cannot function in the church without submitting to the authority of the president of the church. And so, and, and I think Joseph Smith recognized that, that, yeah, you could be, um, isn't it Alma? who you're kind of out there, right? <laughs> I mean, the Book of Mormon actually has some really interesting, I think Alma 13 is about the fullness of the priesthood. Hmm. We could, that's another whole that's thing, right? Yeah, so, well, and, and we're still gonna come back to the, to the community of Christ, but we'll get there. Well, because the one, the one comment that I want to remember, and I want to say it was Wilford Woodruff, I might have the person wrong, but I remember he wrote a letter about some doe head of an elder that thought he could just marry anybody because he had the ceiling power, yeah. which I think is pretty, pretty interesting. I, I, it was in relation to a, a black-white uh, intermarriage. And yeah, that's really a lot of problems there. And so it, it's interesting to me because it sounds like there's well, a there, possibility. There's a, yeah, there's another story about um, I'm trying to remember who the who it was. Uh, but there was a young man, and, a, and the woman wanted to marry him, and he didn't really care. And the bishop said, oh, well, you're at church dance here. I'll just marry you right here on the spot. And supposedly performed a marriage. And the young man didn't think it was a legit marriage, but the woman did. And he wanted to marry somebody else. And the bishop said, well, you're already married to this other girl. I, I performed the marriage. And I was just like, that is such a foreign idea. I mean, clearly it was outside the temple. But I guess if it's a bishop, you, just, you don't need to be inside the temple. Um, but, he, but he's like, well, can you take a second wife? Because polygamy was big back then. So it's interesting to me when we talk about this because well, and there's I think, just a lot of interesting things in the early days of the church. No, like, and I agree. And I agree that basically I, he, that Joseph Smith did create several problems that, you know, whether or not he intended that he was going to come back and kind of show the relationship among all these things, you know, who knows, right? But I think that the problems, I mean, they're there with the, even if you're not thinking of ceilings in the larger sense of being sealed up to eternal life or something like that, you're just thinking of marriages or children to parents. Um, there, it has created all kinds of nightmares because the, the concept is great, right? Oh, wow, we'll have eternal families and we're, gonna, we're interconnected and we're going to have these heavenly relationships. But then the whole question of, okay, a spouse dies and then this happens. And of course, Jesus, they asked Jesus a similar question. You know, if a man has, you know, the, if, if a woman has these different husbands because they've died or whatever, you know, who is married to her in eternity? And he avoids it. And we're, we won't go there because that's another complicated question. But the point of it is, is that whether we're talking ceilings or we're talking the fullness of the priesthood, it creates problems within the organization of the church. So on the one hand, I kind of think, well, I don't like the fact that the church likes to bury this stuff, but I can understand why they do. I mean, it gets, yeah, what do you do with the rogue priesthood holder, right? right. But actually that happens not just with the fullness of the priesthood, but charismatic priesthood. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Margaret Toscano. In our next conversation, we'll discuss popular speakers at church. How do leaders react to those? What if you have somebody who's more interesting and spiritually powerful than the prophet of the church? That's a problem. It's a problem. So let's not encourage that. Mm -hmm.
If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.